All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Head to Foot Ortho webinar. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us. Um, all you Melbournians, I hope you've been enjoying some freedom. Just nobody sneeze when you're out and about or, or maybe locked down again. Um, look, what is great uh, to have you all here with us today. Um, I'll just ask you this time, if you haven't muted, please do so. I think I've muted everyone, but just in case, if you haven't done that, I um, greatly appreciate you mute your mics. And if you have any questions, please put it down in the chat box. And uh, if you have it during the session, just put it in the chat box and we'll address this during the Q&A time uh, towards the end of the um, presentation. So this evening's webinar is on dynamic orthoses for the pediatric and adult patients, a solution for tone and contracture management. This presentation will explore the histopathology of contractures, the concept of low load prolonged stretch. We'll have a look at some case studies um, as well as treatment protocols. So our speaker this evening, a lot of you may already know her, is Bora Vasi, who is a physiotherapist and clinical prosthetist and orthotist with over 15 years of experience in neurological and orthopedic um, management and rehabilitation. So I'll give the floor to you, Flora. You can share your screen and uh, yeah, look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Steve. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm in Belgium, so it's good morning for me. <clears throat> so if my voice isn't warmed up, it's maybe it's not COVID, it's just because it's in the morning. So really happy to be um, with you. And I will, if everything goes well, up, share and start with the presentation from now on. So today we're going to talk about, or this evening, we're going to talk about the dynamic orthosis, and it can be a solution for tone and contracture management. So like Steve said, we're going to talk a little about, about ortho and neuro, um, the histopathology um, of uh, the contractures, the reasons why we should treat um, contractures in CP. Uh, what about prevention? A big topic for me. Um, and then we, of course, going to talk about a protocol and the eventual concept uh, of the dynamic orthosis and some case studies just are going through during the program. Well, we all know what a contracture is, of course. It's a condition of shortening of muscles, tendons, and uh, or other connective tissue, which often leads to deformity and rigidity of joints. Eventually, that will lead to a decrease of range of motion. And if we look really close to it, we'll also see that there is uh, less strength into those muscles. But we do have good news. We will talk about the possibility that it can be reversible. Um, and uh, the reason, the first reason we should ask ourselves is why should we treat? Or why should we prevent contractures? So that's a very important thing um, before we start treating uh, contractures. So the first thing we can say is, yeah, we'll need an elongation of connective tissue because I will, uh, I want an increase of range of motion, but why is it always needed? And um, uh, in what cases uh, should we do it? So one of the good things is sometimes you need more range of motion just to restore the loss of function. In this case, and a patient we will see her later on is somebody who had so much knee flexion contractures that she was not able uh, to walk anymore without help. Um, so range of motion is needed just to stand for... Uh... If we're talking about, sometimes I ask the question to um, students that I see and that I train and I say, if I'm just, I do have a patient and he will not be able to walk anymore. Do I have to treat, for example, equinus? And I hear a lot of time, no, we should not. Oh yes, of course we should, because if we need, or if we want to do um, uh, a good seating device, it's very important that we do have good foot position, position. So that's also a reason just to treat, even if we only have people that are seated. And again, for maybe people that just don't walk, but just for hygienic purposes, um, we need the abduction uh, in the legs just to put a diaper on some things like that. So it's very important to have that range of motion as well. Um, 
And then of course, applying slow force and uh, prevent is to make sure that the tissue underneath is uh, under well traction, which makes uh, that we have a better reorganization of fibers. And of course, and very important thing, and I always say, once you've smelled them, you really know you should prevent, um, it is ulcers or bad wounds. Um, so of course, we'd like to open up uh, the limbs just to have, uh, uh, again, hygienic, but also not to uh, make wounds. Well, it's good to see where the uh, contractures come from. Um, a lot of contractures come from immobilization. Um, and then the joint function is not required and you have uh, a contracture installed. Um, then we have uh, oedema or hydrops is a very, very important um, uh, thing just to um, make sure, just to fix because if, and I will see a lady, a lady later on who does have uh, edema and had in just two weeks a really bad contracture. So edema is very uh, important. After that, we do have the delayed wound healing. Delayed wound healing um, can also be make sure that the patient is not walking for a long time, so can really uh, go into contractures. And uh, abnormal tone regulation, we all know that from the neuro neurologic patients, um, where hypertonia can just make uh, uh, work into um, in a contraction after all. Fibrosis in injured soft tissue is also a very important thing. And um, the fixation after trauma or surgery for a long time. And of course, something we all know at the moment is the bad positioning during coma. We do have a lot of patients at the moment that uh, came from recovery and they do have equinuses and a lot of spasticity coming up because of the feet positioning uh, during their hospitalization. So that's a very, very important thing. So all those uh, uh, contractures are just leading to uh, yeah, less from, and so we will have our own challenge. So if we look into the histology of the contractures, we will see that there will be adaptive changes uh, after that immobilization. So if we, if we just quickly look into um, the cells, we will see that the crosslinks um, will stick together and we will have a decline of the glycosaminoglycans in between the collagen fibers and they are going to have some adherence uh, into one another. We also do have a bad architecture of that connective tissue. Looking at the myofibroblasts, and we will talk about them later as well, we will see that um, if we have um, a tissue that is contracted, um, you will have a creation of myofibroblasts and um, you will create, to the, thanks to the myofibroblasts, a rigid muscle. So we will also have the synovial uh, villi, we'll uh, which we need to move. After immobilization, we will see that there will be adhesions into that synovial villi and there will be a disrupted ratio between new and old collagen fibers. Um, and we will see that there will be an elevated lower quality collagen uh, coming up. And last but not least, we see the big changes in the active myogenic, my, myogenic sarcomeric structure. So if we look at that muscle, the muscle fiber, then we have the myofibril, and then into that myofibril, we do have our sarcomeres, uh, which um, uh, into the sarcomeres, we have those actins and myosines. So how fast does it go? Well, uh, when you look into uh, the immobilization, we can see that in three days, we lose up to 17% of muscle atrophy. Um, we know it, it goes really fast. In two weeks, we can lose up to 20 degrees of range of motion. This is huge. And after two weeks, we can see that the muscle will adapt in length. They will settle around the angle of immobilization. And that atrophy and the forceless will make that we will have an active range of motion that will decrease. It goes really, really fast. So we will talk about the muscle tissue because it is the first tissue that really 
uh, changes really fast. So that's the reason why I'm gonna talk about the uh, sarcomeric structures inside. So um, after the adaptation, and we will see how the adaptation uh, goes. So you have a sarcomere. In that sarcomere, we do have actines and myosines. When we do have a normal contraction, we have the sliding from the actines into the myosines, and we will um, just have a normal contraction. And if you have a decontraction, they will just release. If we do have contracture, those actines and myosines will just slide in one another, but they will never come back. So the overlap will be, um, will be there. There will be no more sliding into one another. And once they are sticked in this position, you will see that there will be an adaptation, but uh, they will get shortener. The actines and myosines will just shorten up and then recreate an overlap and gets even shorter and shorter until the moment that they will just not have a function anymore and they will just disappear. But I told you before, it's, uh, we do have good news and it can be a reversible process by applying elongation force onto the cells. Applying the elongation force uh, for the better low force, you will create an adaptation in those structures and eventually the sarcomeres will just have a little um, stretch. And when you apply that stretch, you will see the actines and myosine to have a normal overlap again. And once they have that normal overlap, you will see that they will be able to just grow and just multiply themselves um, by the sarcomerogenesis. This is a very beautiful schedule. Here you can see on the uh, little schedule here above, you can see that when you have a normal flexion and a normal extension, you have a certain length with an optimal overlap of those sarcomeres. When we do have a position that has, has been immobilized, um, you will have here um, deflection that is, or the extension that will not happen. So you have only flexion in this position. And you can see here that the little, the flexors in this uh, position will be shortened up and you will have an increased overlap and eventually they will just disappear. You will have less sarcomeres. At the back side, you will have those uh, the muscle lengthened, and there will be minimal overlap, and uh, you will have sarcomeres added at the end of the immobilization. Knowing that we will have sarcomeres removed and added, that says that while treating and applying that, that force on the other side, we can also do the same thing, but in the other direction. So good to know that um, we do have in wounded tissue, uh, in the synovial villi, we do have faster adhesions in wounded. And I, I said wounded in between um, those little uh, uh, hackers. <laughs> you go for a Dutch word. Um, but those little, um, uh, that sense neurological tissue um, or uh, traumatic injured tissue as well. We can see that it goes real faster. In healthy tissue, you can see it after eight weeks, but it's also um, real fast as well. Very important to differentiate a little bit for children and CP. We do know um, that um, the neurological lesion in CP already causes from the beginning in uh, adaptation in the muscles. We do see um, uh, other muscle tissue in children with CP than just, for example, neurological diseases or CVA persons um, after that. So we see that the muscle is different and there's also already muscle atrophy in those muscles. We see fibrosis also already coming up. Um, the muscle shortening is already uh, into um, the neurological lesion of CP and we already see overstretched sarcomeres. So in children with CP, uh, we see shorter muscle fibers, we see fewer in series sarcomeres, and with that we also see that there is lack of muscle growth uh, due to the neurological lesion already there, 
Um, so it's very important, and we read it all the time again, that stretching should be really, it, it is necessary just not to uh, have or to prevent uh, contractures in the future because we can maintain what we have. It can really disappear really fast, but it's really important that we uh, maintain what we have. So prevention is uh, as maybe more important than uh, the treatment as such. So talking about prevention and treating, when we talk about prevention, it's much easier uh, for the patient to wear and to accept because prevention, we are not, um, we can just give it to the patients and say, we want you to wear it a lot of time, as much as possible, but it has not to be worn each day, at least so many hours, because if you have a treatment, it's really important that we know how many hours you're wearing it, uh, that we measure if we have a gain or not, because we wanted to, and we will see that later on, we need to know how much torque we need to apply on that uh, joint. So prevention or treating, well, wearing the, the brace for prevention is much more acceptable for the patient than to wear it for treating. Um, we will maintain in prevention, maintain the range of motion or increase a little bit the range of motion. And um, what we see as well, and in a few countries they are doing that already, is to apply orthosis on um, with multi-motion just after children or adults has been injected to wear both with Botox. So um, yeah, it, it's, you have that, um, uh, can't find my word, um, you have the effect of the Botox and you just sustain it with uh, multi-motion. And what you can do is you maintain what you have at that moment. And we hope that we cannot, that the tension will just stay low uh, for a longer time. So we're gonna do dynamic contracture management with multi-motion. Those are orthoses that head to foot orthoses make. So you probably know it, but they do make um, custom-made orthoses with uh, multi-motion in pre-prec or polypropylene, whatever you want. Um, so you can send your cost to them and they will um, make it for you. So if you want to have some information on that, please contact Steve um, and he will answer you all what you want to know. So we will do dynamic contraction management following, of course, LLPS. LLPS stands for low load prolonged stretch. It's a theory concerning the application of a mild lengthening force over an extended period of time. So we will apply uh, that force. So the most beautiful examples are children growing. We all went to that LLPS process. We all grew without um, feeling it, but all our cells were just adapting while we are, were growing. Uh, a lady getting pregnant is exactly the same. You do have the, the belly that is changing and expanding. And when a child is gone out, then you will have the belly just back to its normal uh, length. So that is also LLPS. So it's a really natural process. During this presentation, I use a lot of time stretch. We're gonna stretch, we're gonna apply the lengthening force. Just for your information, eventually what we are doing is we do, uh, we will have the application of an almost constant load. Well, Technically, we should use the word creep instead of stretching. So what we're going to do is to creep the tissue instead of stretching, create some creep. This is a beautiful one and a very important one because if you apply too much force, it will result, and it's very logical, um, it will result, uh, result in microscopic tearing of tissue, oedema, inflammation and even tissue necrosis if you put too much force on tissue. And this, this is said that prolonged gentle stress is a key factor to achieving remodeling. So what is the stretching we do? We all know the curve and we all know that every tissue, every material has his own curve. 
where we do apply some stress, some Newton meters, and where we create an elongation. And at a certain point, we will have, after uh, too many stress, you will have a fracture coming up after you've gone to the plastic behavior. First of all, when you stretch, you will go through that elastic plastic transition. And um, we, we all know it, when you just release an elastic, for example, it will come back in its normal position. And we do that as PTs as well. As we uh, have, for example, um, we try with our hands to do the manipulation to have that, um, um, yeah, to, to have the deformation and, and we manipulate and we open up the ankle and we gain some degrees in range of motion. Well, two days later, patients come back and what we've gained two days ago is gone already. Well, that is in that elastic plastic transformation. So longer stretching, and this is also a beautiful schedule um, out of the therapeutic stretching and physical therapy, is the faster you stretch, the stiffer and the higher the force will be, but the stiffer you will have your outcome. So slower stretching will result in a greater elongation and then the higher stretching velocities. So it's very important just to stay really low with the intensity. So to win a competition, and it's, it's really like a little warrior playing with the pathology who wants to retract, and you have uh, us wanting to win an elongation. Well, it's very important that we apply the orthosis in this case very long. The longer you will just wear it, the better the outcome will be. But it's very important that if you've gained in range of motion and that will come back a few times, it's important to use that range of motion and to try to uh, use it in functional movements. For example, if we're talking about an equinus treatment, um, it's very necessary to put those people to walk or at least to stand to use the range of motion they have. Talking about the elbow, very uh, important to reach something, to try to use an OT, for example, um, some uh, reaching things. So it's very important to do that, to maintain it. in, uh, And then we just don't go for it. Okay. So why can't we apply too much force? We could say that let's, let's just stretch over that plastic behavior uh, until we do have deformation, right? Well, we should stay very, very low because we do have, if we apply too much tension on, we do have an activation stimulation of the myofibroblast. And the myofibroblast, we've talked before, will make sure that they will retract and preserve the muscle belly. And this is why they, uh, we, we need to stay below the trigger of the myofibroblasts because they have that contractile properties. So we need to stretch differently. And this is how we will do it. We will just create an elongation, but with less stress. And we will create even a better and maintained elongation after a while. So, by working with LFS, we will save the integrity of the tissue. We will not create myofibroblasts. And of course, and it's very important, it need to be, be painful. Is it comfortable? No, you always have that orthosis on. It is something hard that is not comfortable, but it is efficient. So a good thing to consider is after we do mobilization, it's really needed to have a stabilization of the joint. So we should ask ourselves, do we have after that mobilization enough active stabilization or do we need uh, compensation strategies because we don't have an active mobilization? For example, um, if, we, if we can and we do have good outcome, well, it means that we have enough muscle strength, enough coordination that leads to control if you don't have it. We can think about, can we train people or do they need an orthosis afterward? So this is a multi-motion we talk about. You haven't seen it, uh, but this is the one. 
Uh, so it really moves with a flat coil spring in the beginning. Well, here we go with flat coil spring. So this is inside the multi-motion and it's very different than to an elastic, for example, because the uh, flat coil spring, his tension will follow a linear curve while moving or while the, while the, during the treatment. So even when you move up in degrees of flexion, for example, you will see coming back is very smooth. If you do that with an elastic, you will have a really fast exponential uh, a stretch and you come fast, really, really uh, fast. You come down really, really fast. So what does exist? Well, we do have a small joint for the ankle. All the multi-motion products are adjustable in tension. We will talk about how to do that. Um, and we do have a small one and a regular one up to 10 Newton meters. So this is on a T-bar that can be used for the ankle. We also have customers that use just the integrated straight bar and not a T-bar on the ankle. That's really up to you. Depends on what you want or what, uh, of course, material you're using. This is how it looks like in the ankle. After that, you can use multi-motion for the elbow, knee, and wrist joint. And you can use it with the just integrated straight bar. And we do have, again, the small one and the regular one. And this is how it can look like on a knee, an elbow, or a wrist. Of course, you can also use multi-motion on the hip abduction joint, which is a beautiful system to have that abduction uh, at night on the patient. Um, it's really effective. We will see a patient later on with that. So how would you build your ptosis? This is more for the technical part of uh, you can choose. And this is something you can also see with PT. What do we use? Do we use is it a small person with slight force or do we really need um do we think we're gonna have a long treatment so you'd better maybe use than a regular one do we use t-bar straight bars um do we use a, a monolateral construction for example for the upper limb if you make a real stiff concept you can use it monolateral um in the lower extremity we always use a free motion joint and you will, uh, I'd love to talk to you about the multistatic because people always say, yeah, but you know, you talk dynamically wise because you don't have a static joint. Yes, we do have a static joint and you will see that you can perfectly combine the dynamic static joint, the dynamic multi-motion with the static multistatic joint. Um, you can perfectly combine them because it's not always required to use a double multi-motion. You perfectly can. We do have beautiful outcomes, but sometimes a static joint is needed and can be used more for uh, example, if you just use statically orthosis and orthotic problems purely, um, uh, it can perfectly uh, be used in neurological problems. I'm not a big fan of working with only multistatic. This is how multistatic works. If the person can get the Allen key in, <laughs> we always laugh, but it's uh, just a human. Um, but there is a key delivered and you can change the posi position just by turning the Allen key. And uh, you can feel because you do it on the patient and it's a small joint, you feel the resistance of the patient. So even by treating statically, this is one of the most beautiful joints because you feel what you do. You're not just tearing uh, tissue apart. So we will we'll look at our first case study and um, the lady you already saw with uh, both knee contractures. Well, she was 63 years old and in 2011, she uh, decided to do a total knee replacement at the left side um, and in 2015 as well. But she had already in the beginning, right after her first total knee replacement, already a contracture. She went out with her right knee. She had also a contracture, but this time with a lot of pain and she went back to her doctor. Uh, well, he decided to do passive mobilization under anesthesia. Um, and since then, she was bedridden. Bedridden with... I think it will be due to the mobilization under anesthesia. It was the popliteus nerve was damaged. 
And because of her laying in the bed all the time, she got deep ulcers on both heels, equine is on both feet. And of course, because she's not being active, a lot of atrophy. In June, the treatment was required uh, and see if we could do anything with multimotion for, uh, with a, for a contracture treatment on both the knees and ankles. First of all, what should we do or how should we do it? Well, it's very important to measure. If you want to do it right, please measure. Um, goniometers, we can give it to you if you don't have one or people sometimes just do it by an app or uh, by taking pictures and then just measuring on the pictures. All those things are possible as long as you do it on the same measuring points. Uh, that's very important. And um, we, of course, suggest, suggest to use the low load prolonged stretch control protocol. What did we do in this uh, case study? Well, uh, we just applied here uh, a double multi-motion. Uh, on the right side and a left on the uh, a multi-motion and multi-static on the left side. Well, that was because there was not a problem in her ankle at the left side. Um, and we also asked PT and OT to do more functional and occupational therapy and uh, to do more muscle strength while we were treating as well. If we look at the right side at the knee, you can see here, you can see the active range of motion and the passive range of motion. So this was only orthotic problems. Um, well, we had a popliteus nerve damage, of course. Uh, and in the ankle at the right side, we saw that we had lost um, with the knee in 90 degree, we had a loss of 12 degrees and uh, dorsal flexion, the passive range of motion with an extended knee was minus 22 degrees. In the left side, we saw minus 36 um, and in passive minus 35. And the knee 90 degrees, we can see here that we had five degrees and minus three degrees at the knee with the knee extended. So, how do we work here for the setting of the joint? Um, it's very important to know what concept will we do. Will we use a biarticular concept or monoarticular? Well, we choose, of course, the biarticular, like you saw. Um, and this is how you can twist just the spring um, by, uh, in, this is something the CPOs are doing, the tardists. It's not the, the PT's job, of course. What did we do in this case? Well, you saw already that we have a yellow and a red spring. Well, having a yellow and a red spring, it uh, gives some, um, uh, some good, you can change uh, sides. Uh, you can change the action of um, the joint. So we use to assess the knee extension, the yellow spring and the dorsal flexion, the red spring. At the left side, we use the red spring and we had a multistatic on the ankle, so just the red spring. So we look at this graphic here and you can see it's very, very um, uh, interesting. You can see we have an evolution. You can see here the ankle and there is the knee, extended knee and uh, flected knee. But you can see here the little orange bars are the wearing time. Well, the wearing time is very interesting. We started in a real hot summer. We're not used to that in Belgium. So not every hospital had at that moment um, uh, clean, um, air conditioning. So it was really hot. And we already noticed that she has had deep ulcers before. And she started to have little wounds on her heels. And that's why we decided to not to stop the treatment, but to really slow the hours or really um, uh, decrease the amount of hours. So we saw directly by putting less hours diartosis on that we were stagnating in the results. So that's very important to know that the more you're going to use the dynamic joints, the better the outcome will be. And so 
this is just an indication. If you want to ask me how much force or how much torque did you put on? Well, this is exactly the outcome. We just notice this, but it is really only an indication. You cannot say I will put three Newton meters on and it will work very well. That does not work that way. It's very important that you just follow the protocol and you only increase if you don't have an, in, uh, a gain of range of motion. We will come back to that later. So if we look at the gain we had, we had in the knee in the active range of motion, a gain of 19 uh, degrees in 89 days, a gain of 17 degrees um, passively. In the ankle, we gained 24 and again, 24 with the knee extended up to two degrees. In the left side, we had a gain of 13 degrees, a gain of 15 degrees, a gain of 17 degrees, and a gain of 25 degrees. So that's pretty beautiful um, for just having, knowing that we had contractures for more than one side, almost seven years, um, and we only had, 89 days to treat because after that the doctor wanted her to get out of the hospital. So um, it's, it's, it's important to, to know that. So before we started, I've never filmed her because she was bedridden. She was only be able to go to the toilet with two persons. No walking aid uh, was possible. So in 89 days, she was able to, oh, I really want to show you that. Let's see. Oof. I was there, you can hear it. <laughs> but you can see that she is able now to extend actively. Does she need more strengthening? Yes. Does she maybe need her toes? It's just, yes. Does she need two shoes to walk? Also. So it's very important. I never well, asked her to walk with one shoe. This is how she walked when I uh, saw her in the hallway. But this is um, uh, what you can achieve just in 89 days. Just do we have a gain in range of motion? Yes. Do we have our goal achieved by just making sure that, um, uh, that she could uh, just do some functional uh, actions? Yes. So how does the process go uh, if we do the LLPS treatment? Um, well, we see the changes in connective tissue. We, saw, we said it before, we're gonna apply the force on the tissue and the reorganization, reorganization will start. It will start real fast in four days into the muscle tissue and into the ligaments and connective tissue. It will take much longer in ligaments in six weeks in connective tissue. It can take up to several months. So that means that we need to start treatments as soon as possible. If you feel that you're going to have, uh, while well, you see your patient, for example, I do a lot of testing for AFOs and I always feel with the knee extended and with the knee flexed, you feel how, what the mobility of the ankle is, you feel it in the uh, knee as well. And if you feel really that tension coming up and you feel that you really cannot go up to five degrees of dorsal flexion, in my opinion, uh, that this is absolutely the moment where we need a resting orthosis uh, with a, a dynamic device just to avoid the retraction and to make sure that you really have that um, uh, mobility in that ankle because you cannot make a good AFO if you don't have a good mobility in the ankle. So the first thing we should really uh, do is to apply, and I think, oh, there's a slide I cannot see, um, the total end range time. It means that we need to apply force at the end range of uh, uh, the, the end range. Uh, and the time you apply that force at the end range is very important. So again, dynamic joint will follow um, that end range and will push uh, into that end range and maintain the force at that point. So, so very important. The intensity is really important that you increase the capacity, the load capacity very slowly. No need to start at uh, the half of the, uh, the, the, the half of the um, uh, strength of the joint. It's really you just do it step by step. Well, here you see the slide has been slided. Um, so we talked about that. 
So manual therapy, it's not miraculous. No orthosis is. We really need to have the PTs next to the treatment with the dynamic joint because we do have a more effective outcome if we do eccentric stretching, for example, which will promote more strength and more length um, and translation uh, movements. So if you do really the gliding of the joint in combination with uh, maybe your own uh, manual uh, applications in combination with a dynamic joint, besides you will have a beautiful outcome. And people who can, and that's maybe interesting, I just met a young guy with a real uh, traumatic leg, and he's now recovering for, I believe, more than two years, and he, he recovered really well, and he walks a lot with an AFO, and he, he came from an, a stance control tosis to an AFO, the big recovery. And I said, yeah, well, if you walk that much and you do have a range of motion in the ankle, maybe you can just try to wear the nitrotosis less. The dynamic zone said, no, 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 no. You, you, you need to give it really. I, I need it because my ankle is so stiff if I don't wear it. So I really need that orthosis is nice. And apparently it's not what we feel and see. They feel it as well. We already said it. If you have gained in range of motion, it's very important that you just try to use it and it's really that if you don't use it you will lose it so we call it the dynamic treatment because we will apply uh, the, the dynamic stretch over the whole range of motion and um, we talked about the total end range time well if this is the position of your total end there's the mouse here she is um, the total end you will just have, by applying the force, you will have a joint, that, a joint that is following the gain you have made and your new end range will be the beginning, the rum in the beginning with the gain, the some degrees you've gained. And that will be your, your new end range. So that means that you will not only gain, but you will maintain the gain and go further on. So it's a very effective uh, joint. And thanks to the fact that it is a dynamic joint, in this case, we are just asking her to, to flex and she's sliding with her heel into, this is a uh, cut it, uh, uh, bench, but uh, she is able to move. So imagine children with a lot of spas spasms, they can move. It's not only in hip, but also in elbows, for example. Uh, they can just extend if they want to, but the moment they're just in rest again, they can go to flexion or go to extension, whatever is needed. Very important for a dynamic treatment is that we do the treatment by a multidisciplinary team. And I insist on the fact that PTs are and OTs uh, are next to uh, the patient um, because a follow-up is needed. And of course, we need a compliant patient. We as a team can be as effective as, as, as can be, but if the patient decides not to put his orthosis on, it's very difficult to have good results. So it starts, of course, with the patient and we need to be there just to do a good follow-up. So how does we start, do we start? Well, first of all, we're gonna check if there is no ankylosis or real fibrosis into um, uh, the joint and uh, the muscle fibers. We need to check if the arthrokinetics are good because that's very important. If you don't have a good position of the bones, well, probably you won't, won't have the last grease. Um, so that's also really important to know. If you really hesitate, uh, uh, addicts can just, uh, bring the outcome. And then comes a very important part. You need to decide whether we're going to make the orthosis monoarticular or biarticular, which is very important for the outcome. Sometimes you can say, yeah, biomechanically wise, I do have a better outcome with a biarticular joint. But I always ask myself the question, is the person going to be able to just sleep with it, to accept it. So sometimes you better cut your tosses in two. I have a little story of a, a man with a brain injury 
big neurological uh, trouble after that. And he couldn't speak, but his eyes were speaking uh, very clearly. So he had a deduction in his hips. He has flexion contractures in his knee. He had um, uh, equinus on the feet. So the doctor asked, yeah, we need our toes. So the first question you need to ask is, what is the goal? What do we need to achieve? What do you think the prognosis is? So the, the goal was to put him into a standing table. So, well, you always do the anamnesis and you just feel the patient, what's in happening. So by just putting my hands on the both legs and just uh, manipulate them, he was shooting me with his eyes. And I was like, doctor, if we are going to apply for the beginning, biarticular um, uh, biomechanically 100% fine, orthosis is on. Um, I'm not sure he is going to accept it. And um, why not choose for to cut the orthosis? We didn't cut the orthosis, but to cut the, the, the concept and make just a knee orthosis and uh, an ankle orthosis. So during the night, we put it uh, KOs uh, on with multi-motion. During the day, while he was seated, he put it AFOs on with multi-motion. Was that biomechanically wise the perfect solution? No. But in 30 days, we had a person that stands into a standing, uh, standing table with just one centimeter and a half of heel height. So did we achieve our goal? Yes, we did. And he accepted the orthosis. And I saw him later on and he walks right now. So it's very important to uh, sometimes make choices that we and do we always make the correct choices probably not we're just humans so after defining the concept of the, of the orthosis you can also see if we are going to work by articular wise uh, with two multi-motions or maybe we will we combine the multi-static with a multi-motion um, so it it can really take some different uh, concepts once you've chosen that and the uh, see the orthodist made the orthosis, um, you can start bit by bit the treatments. So the first thing is do not apply any tension on it. Slight, slight, slight tension and just make sure that the patient accepts the orthosis and can increase the wearing time because it's not comfortable to just wear an orthosis while you're sleeping. The, pur the purpose is no pain, no injuries. And if the person says, yeah, well, I can easily sleep, or you have patients that say, I cannot sleep, but I wear it from six o'clock in the evening and I'm in my uh, couch uh, laying and I wear it until 11. And then I, in the afternoon, I put it uh, two, three hours more uh, on. I feel the benefit. Well, I'd rather have that than somebody who says, I don't wear it at all. So um, you like the patients to... Uh, wear your toes, you increase the wearing time, and once you've achieved that, you can really start your treatment. So before you start the treatment, it's important that we measure, that we measure the active and passive range of motion, and not only range of motion of the joint, but depending, is so in the case studies, for example, talking about an ankle, depend on how the knee is positioned. That's why we measure with the knee extended and the knee in 90 degrees. So we do deliver in the box uh, a chart that you can fill in and it's very important you use it because if there's a, a struggle somewhere we can just go back and see what happens what uh how how did we increase or not the range of motion well we measure again i saw it before you can do it with a goniometer with uh photographs with an app uh every or digital meter you can uh, do whatever you want as long as you measure with the same measuring points and then of course we need to pt next to the orthotic treatment to make sure that the rolling glide um may sus stay sustained um, and we work with an orthosis real hard on the roll and it's important for you to do it on the glide so we ask for some translation movements into the articulations 
once you've gained a little bit of range of motion and next to the therapy, uh, we uh, think it's very important to use the range of motion and to adapt the functional activities so they can use what they have achieved, achieved and gained. Oh, let's go forward. The best is to measure one to two times a week. Two times, of course, is better because you have a faster, uh, you can a faster change, but I know it's not that easy. So one times in a week uh, is, is, uh, is probably fine. Um, and so you have, will have a good uh, a follow up. If you don't have gain, so you have uh, a patient that wore your toesis, that doesn't have any pain, accepts it very well. You measure week A, week B, and you see on week B, I do have the same range of motion outcomes than the week before. Well, at that moment, you can intensify the load and just by, by just one turn key uh, to avoid the overload because we don't want a myofibroblast to be active. And if we're talking about people with spasticity, um, it's very important to stay below the trigger of spasticity so uh, that we don't really uh, trigger that. And then it's a matter of fact of keep going, keep going, keep going, and uh, keep going. In summary, it is you increase your wearing time. The more you will wear it, the better the outcome will be. If you have no increase of range of motion, passive range of motion, and you don't have uh, pain, well, then you can just turn up the load by one key turn. The best result will be when a combination of facts, functional therapy, manual therapy, uh, implement the range of motion in the activities of daily living, in combination with your orthotic treatment, you will have a beautiful result. And I said it before, prevention is for me a very important thing. We just said that if we apply slight force on a limb, we will create an elongation. Well, if we do it, uh, if we look at our patients in rehab centers, for example, you will see that those patients are almost um, for, and I'm, they say I'm very optimistic, I said eight hours in bed, but that's not true. It's up to 14, 16 hours, people here in Belgium are in bed. Um, and then we do have a position, patholog pathologic position, but a natural position as well. We never sleep with our feet in 90 degrees. Uh, so the feet are already into equines. We do have gravity. We do apply a blanket above the ankles. And without knowing, we are just applying slight force into the wrong direction. During 10 to 14 hours, people are having a slow stretch. And by nature, we do know that the posterior chain is just retracting faster than the anterior chain, just like our uh, uh, pectoralis is uh, uh, retracting faster than the posterior chain. So, Good to know all those things, but also good to know that without knowing and without applying a, a position or a, a good um, uh, orthosis on, we are just creating an equinus. So it's very important if we don't want an increase in tone and spasticity to maintain a good natural position in 90 degrees. And it's really, if you think about it, what well, is a beautiful little... Um, image. This is how I found people in bed. They are not bedridden, but they stay long hours in bed. And this is how we found them. Even if they do efforts, they are putting blankets all over the bed rest. And even then you see the foot are in equinus. They are there for 10 to 14 hours. We come as a PT or as an OT and we ask them to stand up, to put your toes on but we do have a stiff ankle, so it's not that easy. We need to remind that. I told you just a few uh, slides before that a contractor can really, really come up very fast. Well, this is a beautiful example of a lady. She came in like this. 
and she um, she had a sock on. I asked her to remove the sock before she entered uh, because I wanted to see uh, what happens. And I love to see people in their normal way. Um, she didn't wear any shoes though. Um, so this is how she entered. So I was like, okay, what is what is your attempt? What do you have? She was like, nope, nothing. I just had a surgery in January. I was like, what? So she had an aorta surgery and she was two weeks in hospital. And since then she had an Aquinas feet foot, not feet, foot. Um, and she said, I, I said to her, it's, it's a pity. They should have positioned your foot while you were hospitalized. And she said, but they did. And I say, yeah, probably, but um, it's a pity that I, that we cannot go back and see what they put it on. And then she said, I think I do have a picture. So this is very beautiful. This is uh, really rare. We got this. But this is how she was positioned into her bed. She is in a positioning device, which is not at all custom made, but people are moving. You see big audema on the foot and, and she is in some of, not sure how you call it in English, but we call it a Gutierre. Um, and, and she's in it, but if people move, that doesn't move with the patient. So yeah, she was positioned, but in equines for a long time. So she went out and now we started the treatment um, for her, but we do not gain a lot because there, yeah, there has been some time um, after that. Talking about tone, what can we do with tone? We do have another way of uh, managing tone. Um, this is just by searching the right um, uh, force to have that relaxation on tone. And then you don't have to increase. You can increase if needed, but it's not the purpose. So what happens? You can see here um, my Michelle. And Michelle is just uh, struggling with tone and um, after uh, a CVA. A lot of tone and a lot of pain. He really was in pain. And the first question was, from the doctor, can you offer something to him during the night not to be in that uh, flexion pattern all the time? So they say, well, you know, I do have testing devices. Uh, maybe we can try. Well, we see when we apply. Um, yeah, they always will trigger spasticity. We've said that. Um, we applied, if you see him here and you see him there, we applied, you can see a total different face as well, but you can see how smooth that goes. So even with the testing device, he directly had that relaxation coming up and thanks to uh, the slight force that is applied, he can actively better action uh, his flexion. So it's beautiful to see what just a slight force can do on tone. This man, for the record, I put it after because he was just testing and I put it after uh, a while. I just said, you know what? Because I saw the hand was very close. I said, let's put a tennis ball in your hand and see what happens. And he said after 10 minutes, hey, Flora, I cannot keep that tennis ball. It keeps falling out of my hand. So it gives also a, a reaction on the hand, a little relaxation on the hand. Good to know is that this patient uses multimotion during the day on his elbow because he says it helps me to do some activities. Um, and during the night, uh, he is wearing uh, multimotion on his wrist to have an opening with his fingers in the functional position. And we work on uh, the elbow, or the, elbow the, the wrist. So you have a beautiful opening uh, for that. So this is really a good topic because sometimes I have here um, the, the question, but what does that cost to the social security? What does that cost? Well, in my opinion, if you don't do it, it will cost much more because if you have a good range of motion, you probably can do anything. Um, you can apply correct ortosis on, you can correctly use uh, your limb. So the better you will treat and the better your range of motion will be, the earlier you will treat, uh, the better the outcome will be, and the less it will cost to the patient or to the social security. Um, we saw here, uh, I, I don't agree with the fact that some people say, well, you know, let's retract everything and we will just operate. And I'm like, what's the cost then? 
uh, if we talk about just costs of an orthosis, I think an operation is much more uh, one painful um, and we never know what happens during an operation. So the cost of an operation is probably higher than just a dynamic uh, joint. Well, I'd love to share with you um, the, our dynamic hip abduction system, uh, which is a system you can apply in between the legs. This is a little boy um, who, is, uh, who has CP and uh, is quadriplegic. And um, he was always in a mattress with straps to fix his legs. And um, the straps, you cannot see them, but they're under here. And you normally, he is just strapped. We have maybe well uh, a little movie afterwards um so this is the position where he was in before and of course the parents do very good and they put the legs uh, even deeper in the mattress and fix it with straps well what happens is that after an hour and a half he starts screaming his uh, communication is very difficult but he starts screaming so uh, the only thing they do is then release the straps they tried not to release the straps and then he just put so many force on uh, his legs that he opens up uh, the velcro so it's pretty impressive how much tension comes up those legs um, so that's why this is static positioning this is why i'm not a big fan of static um, and it's really uh, sad to see that we uh, maintain uh, try to maintain that abduction in such a static position. If you look correctly how he is now into that mattress, um, he has that end rotation of the femur. Um, you even have, you don't see it really well, but uh, equine is on the foot. Um, you have risks for subluxation on the hip. So it's really not the best position you want. This is the same boy with a dynamic hip abduction system on. He was cold, by the way. Um, but you can see here how beautifully you have that uh, abduction combined with the external rotation, which is very important for the positioning of the hip. So he had also multi-motion, so a dynamic joint on the ankle and a static changeable joint, multi-static on his knees. It's a beautiful uh, system. You can just release the, the AFOs uh, or the KFOs. You can just open it up by this little black button and you just apply one KFO, then the other, and then you apply the system. So the only thing you really need to be aware of is that the heels, and in this case, it is not beautifully presented, um, but uh, the PT, uh, CPO, excuse me, the orthotist, orthotist um, could just apply here a, a beautiful uh, square of P um, polypropylene just to let the heel slide onto uh, a flat um, uh, side. So what can you do with, and it's beautiful, I love the combination of multi-static with uh, the hip abduction system, because you can say, well, in the beginning, I don't want the biarticular uh, uh, adductors uh, to interact. So let's just start with the slight flexion. We do have then with the flexion in the knees, a beautiful uh, dealer doses. Um, so the pelvic is gonna be well positioned. And then um, we can say, let's work on the abduction. If you've gained an abduction, then you can maybe say, well, I'm not gonna increase the force of the abduction. I'm just gonna put a little bit more of knee extension on it. So you can play with abduction, knee extension, and it will work on um, the adductors eventually. So this is how it works. This is a PT of the little boy. And she is learning how to adjust the joint. You can see how it moves. So she so shows us because she needs to learn to work with it. So you can see applying more flexion or more extension, something uh, she can easily do. If we look at, that's the same. 
If we look at the other possibilities, so we talked about the possibility to work on AB vectors and uh, to work on um, uh, the extension of the knee, we can also work on the external rotation. That's beautiful about the dynamic hip abduction system. It's not only AB abduction, it's also external rotation. And this is how it goes. You have here just, you just, I, you need an Allen key. Um, and you can just open it up a little bit and you can just turn up to more than even 40 degrees of external rotation, which is huge. But you do, you can play, you do whatever you want to choose the perfect position for your child. And I say children, but it can perfectly be used with adults. We do, I do follow a few adults. We will see a man afterwards as well. This is another beautiful case study. This is a case study with um, a lady who had a CVA 31 years ago, and she had um, a deficiency of the dorsal flexors, but she really wore, she, she, she did that very good. She wore high heels, uh, so nobody could see that she had uh, a deficiency. But a few uh, years, 30 years later, she starts to struggle with her knee and to have really bad uh, coordination and really instability in the knee. And she goes up to that hyperextension in the knee. At a certain point, um, she came in and uh, came from a doctor that had given her a knee brace. And we said, yeah, well, we think it comes from uh, the plantar flexion that is in the ankle. So maybe we should try and see if we can change something in that. So by doing good anamnesis, we saw that we had an equinus that we could not produce up to passive range of motion with a knee in zero degrees and 90 degrees up to minus 10 degrees. So we started during COVID, oh, um, we started uh, to do the treatment and this is how she, this is, was recorded after her treatment, because you can beautifully see how the hyperextension is well installed in that, um, in the, the hip and the knee as well. Yeah. And what we did was we started with an AFO, um, because we did have uh, the same uh, range of motion with a knee extended and a knee flexed. Um, and she started to do exercises, went to her PT. She worked seven to eight hours a day. Uh, a lot of translation and exercises were added. And uh, a few months later, she came back. It was really difficult to do the follow up. It was really during the first uh, lockdown and she, uh, the second lockdown, and she came back and said, yeah, not sure if you're gonna be happy, but I think I've gained a bit. So while just testing, she went up to zero while walking with the force of the body and the speed, we could see that she uh, went over that uh, 90 degrees. So that's very beautiful because that means that we could apply an orthosis that was able to align correctly the body. If you look back to, and I will go back just to check, you look back to this position and you look back to the aligned orthosis, you have a beautiful uh, position in here. So this is with her big hyperextension, having really bad shoes with really flat soles. And then you have here um, her walking and see the control of her knee. But you can see here when she just ends at the end of the stance phase, she just fades away in those really bad shoes. Um, but it's, uh, it does what it needs to do. So she's very happy. She can walk uh, just with normal shoes and has no hyperextension in the knee anymore just by treating her ankle contracture. I'd love to share as well the dynamic hip abduction system for uh, adults. It's also with multistatic on the knee and multimotion. This man had no active uh, abduction, only passive range of motion, right nine degrees and 11 degrees at the left side. And he couldn't uh, really walk because his feet were touching all the time. And um, we just uh, started the treatment in combination. He was already three months in, um, uh, in rehab, uh, already under uh, PT hands, but it was not enough. So after two weeks, he was already uh, 
uh, he could already walk just with crutches instead of a walker and he could separate his feet uh, actively. So that was very beautiful. We don't need a big abduction. But if we look further on after three weeks and training, we can see that um, there is a wider active opening uh, during gait. And uh, you can see that he does that actively. He is possible to do it better on the left side than on the right side. Um, and if we go further on and further on, after four weeks, and it goes really fast, but he was already treated by PT and an OT, but they needed something more. And this is, I think, the missing link into the whole treatment. So in only four weeks, he was really able to have that opening uh, real wide. He did that actively. And he was uh, uh, able to walk um, with in this case, still two crutches, but with one crutch as well. Oh, yeah, with one crutch as well. And you can see he's searching for his stability, but this is learning, this is rehab. And so you can see an opening of the feet very well. So we do have a passive range of motion at the right side, 23 degrees. We only had nine degrees passively. And at the left side, we had 11 degrees, and now we have 26 degrees. And you can see here the active range of motion, which was none before the treatment, is now 14 degrees and 16 degrees. So we do have a big improvement. So beautiful to hear is because we always talk about static or dynamic treatment. Well, this man said, if you remember the, the, the orthosis, he was static on the knee and dynamic on the ankle. He said, I love the fact that I could move because he was able to do plantar flexion. So he, he, he loved when he, was, uh, when he could move in the ankle and at rest, it was beautifully uh, uh, replaced. He was able to do dorsal flexion as well, but he used it really um, as, as a, a good resting moment. And he said, no, after I wore it five, six hours, I started to feel really rigid into my knee and to my hamstrings. And this is exactly what the difference is between dynamic and static. Static really increases tension and dynamic is just a release of function. And then the last clinical case I'd like to share with you is this man, a paraparetic man. It is a really a treatment between retraction and tone. This man seated in, was seated in a wheelchair and only walked with an exoskeletal robot and rehab center. And um, he always had an intensive functional training since the beginning, but he saw our stance control, our swing phase lock uh, system. And he absolutely wanted that to have, to be more stable during stance, um, but to activate our stance control swing phase lock, we need an extension at the end of the swing phase. So I'll let you discover if he does have um, that extension at the end of the swing phase. You will see it from now on. We'll go to the side. And you can see here that I don't have an extension at the end of the swing phase. So my swing phase lock would not lock. And you can see even see a triple flexion um, position. Um, so this was, I said, Mark, I, I'm not sure, I cannot help you at this moment with SPL, but would you be ready to try and see what we can do with multi-motion? Because you do have a struggle with tone. He already took a drugs for that. Um, and would you like to, uh, to, to try? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do whatever it takes um, as long as, as it don't hurt. And it does not hurt. So we um, started with a KFO with a double multi-motion. And um, uh, in the beginning, we just started in uh, the knee. And of course, gravity helped us. Uh, but with uh, 1.9 Newton meter, which is not much, we achieved zero degree in the knees. What did we see? We saw in the dorsal flexion in the ankle, minus 14 and minus 11 degrees in the ankles. So we continued the treatment. We stayed, we maintained what we had on the knee and we continued on the ankle. So these are the blue wearing bars. You can see we go up to seven hours, not much more than that because he didn't sleep that more. And sometimes you see bars not being there. It's because he didn't wear their toes all the time. 
And so after 50 days, I had um, uh, still having my knee in zero degrees. I had a, a, a good result because I went up to minus two and uh, zero degrees in the ankle while I have my knees in uh, full extension. He was a person who, who really, he is still a person where he would really say well what he felt. And he said, if I wear it, I could feel that I'm much yeah, flexible, much more flexible in the morning. So we do know that LPS was already written, but uh, it's always good to hear it from patients as well, that it has a positive effect on the tension. And uh, it made for him also easier to make, uh, uh, to move, to, to have an automatization. Well, then we said, maybe we can try. Remember Mark with uh, the flexion in his knees, dorsal flexion, flexion in the hips, really unstable, not possible for him to walk uh, behind a walker or something like that. So we see here, Mark, with the stance control orthosis, without any treatment uh, of PT behind, this is the first time he puts them on. And you can see that full body extension, which is so important for uh, uh, lower limb orthosis. Um, so the question I always ask, does he really look at the end of the stance phase? No, he uses a little bit of his heel contact just to lock the system. Um, but do we achieve and same question as before, do we achieve uh, the goal that was to have more stability during stance? I think we did. This man, oh, I thought it was another movie. Um, this man now uh, walks behind a walker and um, with SPLs on, the swing face locks on, and he just can move inside his house with a walker. So, Talking about the dynamic LLPS, and we talk about the effects uh, of the dynamic treatment, uh, we can see that it brings inhibition of tone and gives some relaxation, that it increases the compliance because of having nortosis that is much more comfortable. Um, in connective tissue, we see the remodeling or at least status quo of the uh, situation where it's in. It allows the movement, so it says that it will not increase spasticity. Um, thanks to the possibility of moving, we have a decrease of the pressure and uh, it supports the already installed manual and functional treatment. So I'd like to end with that. And if you do have any questions you want to read, there's a lot of uh, uh, reviews and uh, research about contracture and stretching. So, and this is why I say multi-motion to be dynamic. And I'd like to thank you, Steve, back to you in, the, in Australia. Thank you, Flora. That was great. Uh, hey, thanks everyone for tuning in. Are there any questions at all? Look, you can also feel free to email any questions that you may have directly uh, to me, uh, stevej at htfo.com.au. Um, if you'd like to give us a call, um, feel free to do so, 039870 double two eight four now this webinar will be made available um, for you guys just in the next day or so so I'll, I'll be sure to send it out to all of you so you can review it and if you have any questions then just yeah feel free to email us and uh, we'll get back to you with the answers but if there aren't any questions um, I think we've kept you here long enough and again Flora thank you very much for that presentation that was great um, thank you well, we have one here from Chris McCann, Flora. Any success with adult club foot? <clears throat> well, the fact is that the club foot is not in one plane. We do have different planes uh, treating club foot. Um, I'm not sure if what you mean by club foot, I think maybe equinovirus, um, just an equinovirus. Well, if you can reduce, for example, the virus and... Um, uh, you can do that, so you can correct the virus and then work only dynamically wise into dorsal flexion. So in the sagittal plane, I think um, that can work. But if you already have an installed virus, yeah, that will be very difficult to have it back because the joint is not work; it's only working in the sagittal plane. So yeah, that is um, uh, not sure. Um, but an equinovirus reduce the virus and work in equinus. Uh, or reduce the equinus, yes. Not sure that answers the question, yeah. 
All right. Well, that's all. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, Pratibha, yeah, I, I will, I will um, send you out a certificate for um, the webinar today, so uh, you'll be able to use that, no problem. Um, but again, thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank and, you. Uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.